So sex of purpose really refers to the extent to which people see their lives as having meaning, a sense of direction and goals. So sense of purpose is very prospective, directive and goal orientated. And in particular, it tends to have this external component, which I think is really important to emphasize, where there's this desire to make a difference to the world and to contribute to matters larger than the self. Spirituality and religion seem to be good for mental health. Uh, in most studies, outcomes are improved after treatment. Uh, risk of morbidity and mortality is reduced uh, by spiritual and uh, particularly religious affiliation engagement with the life of a faith community. Spiritual well-being translated into less depression and also greater recovery from depressive symptoms when young people have experienced it. Whereas negative religious coping, which means, for example, if I'm going through a difficult time, then I start blaming God. That kind of thing was associated with more depression. Welcome Whatever Works, Beliefs and Purpose. Introducing our speakers, Emily Halsha, Shilpa Agarwal and Christopher Cook. My name is Emily Hilscher. I'm a research fellow based at Kiyama Burkhofer Medical Research Institute, which is in the very sunny Brisbane, Australia. I'm Chris, Chris Cook. I'm Emeritus Professor in the Institute of Medical Humanities at Durham University. And I also have a background in mental health and in psychiatry, um, training in general adult and addiction psychiatry, and then practicing for many years in the NHS in, in addictions. I also have interests in theology. I have a PhD in theology and I'm an Anglican priest. And I'm interested in the intersections between spirituality, theology and health, particularly mental health. My name is Shilpa and I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist uh, by training. I did my basic medical and psychiatry training in India, Mumbai. Mumbai and then I um, got around to doing my fellowship from Royal College of Australia and did my advanced training in child and adolescent psychiatry in Australia. How does sense of purpose affect youth mental health? Uh, yeah, so sense of purpose really refers to the extent to which people see their lives as having meaning, a sense of direction and goals. So sense of purpose is very prospective, directive and goal orientated. And in particular, it tends to have this external component, which I think is really important to emphasize, where there's this desire to make a difference to the world and to contribute to matters larger than the self. Uh, so yeah, just turning attention to the actual commission last year, we conducted an extensive scoping review, um, which examined yeah, the impact of sense of purpose interventions on anxiety and depression in young people. So we found 21 studies which met our eligibility criteria. And yeah, the kind of key take homes are that the interventions which were delivered in a group format and which included multiple sense of, sense of purpose components were the most effective overall with on average moderate reductions in anxiety and depression. Interestingly, we found the interventions were more effective at reducing depression rather than anxiety symptoms. And some of the studies actually looked at subpopulations or subgroups, and they found that these interventions tend to be more effective in young people who have prior therapy experience and those with extroverted personality types. It was a real mixed bag of studies um, in terms of intervention design and dose. So it was really hard for us to make really clear and concrete conclusions about intervention effectiveness. Um, the other key thing to note is that uh, about 85% of the studies were conducted among Caucasian female university students living in middle to high socioeconomic settings. So again, real limitations on the generalizability of these findings from our review. We were also really interested in though these broader questions around intervention feasibility and acceptability. So many of the actual included studies in the review didn't look at this, 
but our discussions with our youth advisory members were really illuminating um, and really highlighted in particular some cross-cultural differences because we had youth advisory groups in both Australia and India. Um, and so some of the key things coming out of that were really, you know, for group interventions in particular, our Indian members said uh, these would only work with members uh, of similar socioeconomic background. Our Australian members were also really positive about things like an online self-paced format, if a moderator was involved, um, but our Indian members did not agree with this at all. Um, and they raised a lot of really sound barriers related to online intervention implementation, you know, particularly around access to a computer or access to the internet generally for young Indians. What are the key components of sense of purpose interventions? The kind of gold standard um, is made up of three key components, um, looking at value exploration or clarification. So where young people would do tasks where like a card sort exercise to try and clarify what their key values are in life. Uh, the next key component is then long-term goal setting um, particularly goal setting, which is again tied back to those values. And then a third pillar around gratitude enhancement, um, which at first doesn't seem intuitive, but actually really good evidence to show that interventions that are specifically targeting gratitude and enhancing that makes people more pro-social um, and more likely to have increased sense of purpose. So those are the kind of three key pillars of these interventions. And they were either delivered online or small in group kind of interventions. Typically, the literature was more upstream, so very much focused on young people who were presenting symptoms of anxiety or depression, but had not yet gone on to develop uh, a, diagnose, um, a diagnosis of anxiety or depression yet. How does Sense of Purpose help youth mental health? Two studies did discuss... Um, the direct impact of sense of purpose on increased self-knowledge and confidence, as well as less, less existential dread and despair. Um, the latter being a really key one and which links back to the kind of history of this whole field, which is logotherapy, which has a central pillar that addressing existential dread can directly reduce depression symptoms. And then we looked more broadly as well. So looking at like cross-sectional and cohort studies and just uh, discussions within our team, our clinical and research teams about what other mechanisms there could be. And really the key ones we also came up with were around um, motivational forces being created by sense of purpose. And that being a key factor in preventing mental health problems. So there is a little bit of evidence showing that behavioural activation could be a key link between sense of purpose and reduced depression and anxiety. So kind of in basic terms, purpose makes you want to get up and do things and, you know, triggers a greater amount of activity, um, you know, including a drive for activities that are personally meaningful to someone. Do spiritual and religious beliefs affect youth mental health? As a gross overgeneralization, spirituality and religion seem to be good for mental health. Uh, in most studies, outcomes are improved after treatment. Uh, risk of morbidity and mortality is reduced uh, by spiritual and uh, particularly religious affiliation engagement with the life of a faith community. Um, I think one of the things that um, I was particularly interested in was the difference between depression and anxiety. And again, this reflects the wider literature where um, spirituality and faith seem to reduce the risk of depression and again, improve outcomes when you're treated for depression. Anxiety, the literature is more mixed. Religious affiliation is associated with greater levels of anxiety. Um, now, the question is, is that causal? Because for example, we know that when people are in places of stress and adversity in their life, they are more likely to return to earlier religious beliefs 
Emily is working on sense of purpose more than spirituality and religion. And um, I just wonder, I'm thinking out loud here, whether um, there might be ways in which having a sense of purpose might increase anxiety for young people. And am I going to achieve these goals in life? Can I do this? Am I good enough? You know, all, all of these questions suddenly come to the fore. If you're laid back and don't care and well, you know, whatever, <laughs> maybe you can be less anxious about some things in life. Um, but once you've got a goal to achieve, then you can worry about failing. It's very interesting, Chris, that you brought uh, the question of increased anxiety, uh, the associations which have been found between increased anxiety and holding religious beliefs, because that's exactly what we found in our review. Although we didn't have many studies looking at anxiety, we had very thin literature as far as anxiety studies were concerned. There were studies which showed that increased participation in religious activities, especially group activities, was associated with increased levels of anxiety in young people. And if they were if they were ethnic minorities, then the chances of anxieties were anxiety were high. So, uh, in addition to that, we, uh, as far as the depression is concerned, we found largely protective effects in in the onset of depression, and we did find a role of religious and spiritual beliefs in the treatment of anxiety and depression in young people, largely in sync with the findings. Again, it's a bit of an overgeneralization, but what is um, there available in, in adult literature. Interestingly, intervention studies, most of them found positive effects. However, the quality of the studies, there was a high risk of bias. So in both intervention and longitudinal studies, which we, we found very high risk of bias. And of course, most of these were done in high income countries. 38 studies out of 45, for example, were done, done in the US, longitudinal studies. And only one was from low and middle income country. Similarly, when we came to intervention studies, around 12 were um, done in low and middle income countries, whereas the rest of them were from high income countries. So whether they are uh, accurately representing how these beliefs work in all settings, we are not sure. However, what, what stood out for us, spiritual well-being translated into less depression and also greater recovery from depressive symptoms when young people had experienced it. Whereas negative religious coping, which means, for example, if I am going through a difficult time, then I start blaming God uh, for my difficulties or uh, trying to um, not see the light at the end of the tunnel, absolute despair, but I'm contextualizing it using my religious beliefs. That kind of thing was associated with more depression. How do spiritual and religious beliefs help youth mental health? The, the belonging to the social network, the community dimension of it is important. And we know much more widely that being well socially networked, part of a, a supportive community is good for you mentally and, and in other ways. Um, so it would be unsurprising that, that faith communities contribute in that way. And of course, there's also the, the behavioral dimension of that. So for example, in one of my own studies quite a few years ago, um, in terms of substance use, young people belonging to faith communities are less likely to use illicit substances, less likely to get into difficulties with um, heavy drinking and that kind of thing. So there's a, a modeling effect of a moderate use of, um, uh, of substances in, in managing life stresses and so forth, not getting involved in, in criminal activity, that kind of thing. So all of this stuff is important. But but I think you are right, and Shilpa is, is certainly right in terms of looking at the inner dimension of it. There's also something about what we believe. Going back to Emily's study, um, do you have a sense of purpose and, and meaning in life? And uh, again, Shilpa's work illustrates the more general principle here that intrinsic religiosity seems to be good for us, extrinsic religiosity isn't. So if your faith is all about being seen to be at a place of worship on the holy day, for example, in the Bible Belt in, in 
the southern United States. Um, you know, 70% of, of the community goes to church in many parts of the southern US. And a lot of it is about being seen to be there, you know, to be with the right people, to be doing the right thing. That doesn't seem to be so good in terms of health outcomes. Um, it's the inner dimension, what, what really matters to you, what motivates you, what drives you in life. The, these are the things that seem to be associated with better mental health. Um, the other thing that um, Shilpa mentioned, which I thought was really interesting, was about the negative and positive religious coping. Again, the literature generally supports what Shilpa is saying, that positive religious coping is good. Negative religious coping seems to be associated with poorer mental health. But, but having said that, um, you know, if you are the person who's struggling with the thought that God doesn't love me, you know, maybe there is no God, why would all this happen to me? It must be because I'm a bad Christian, bad Muslim. Um, actually, those are real issues for you. you. You can't just dismiss those as a clinician or as a, a religious minister. Uh, you have to take them seriously. And there is increasing evidence to suggest that addressing these things in psychotherapy is important in terms of treating spiritual and religious people. It got me thinking about the importance of rituals in our life and for maintaining good mental health. Just thinking about it from you know, my own perspective and thinking about the role that that plays. Um, and the other, and, and yeah, just thinking about how that kind of provides a person, you know, being involved in some sort of religious or spiritual community, that set of rituals, that structure to the day-to-day -day lives. Um, and just kind of drawing parallels with the purpose work, coming back to that really critical element around, you know, being focused on aspects beyond the self, um, you know, which is a really important part of the sense of purpose construct and what a, lo a lot of young people said, like, that's where I draw my purpose from. And I could see potentially that that could also play a role in this relationship between, you know, spiritual involvement and reducing anxiety and depressions. We consider uh, prayer and participating in individual religious activities as a measure of saliness. I think what we couldn't find conclusive evidence when we did the review, but when it came to our advisory committee consisting of young consultants, these, um, these were so important to them. They were spending quite a substantial amount of time during the day do, doing these rituals and activities. And it was so neatly tied in, in the daily routine. And it gave them such a sense of purpose uh, because they told me, okay, we spend two hours um, either chanting or helping out in a, in a um, for example, cooking to take food to the temple and so on and so forth. So various things that they have uh, accommodated in their daily routine. And I think that aspect could also be, um, there is an overlap between that and behavioral activation and giving them something to do during the day with specified time. I think that that could be one of the reasons why it was so rewarding for them. What are the adverse effects of spirituality and religion? We probably need to distinguish between religiously and spiritually integrated interventions in terms of psychotherapy that you're talking about and spirituality and faith generally. I mean, I distinguish those two, um, but I think the principle is probably true in both cases. So, um, for example, although we know that most uh, of the world's major faith traditions seem to be good for most people who participate in them, we know that there are also cults and sects and extreme religious groups which have profoundly negative impacts upon people, including suicide pacts and coercive abusive behavior within the, the group and so on and so forth. So clearly that is harmful. And indeed there's a whole world of providing therapy and support to people who are able to escape from those groups and, and to recover from the um, impact upon them. Um, in terms of, of the interventions, um, I think we probably know less than we ought to know. Um, but again, the principle would hold 
good that you know sometimes these things are not going to help I, I think I just want to take one step back for that before I come back to it um, and this was implicit perhaps in what Shilpa was saying but people can use positive and negative religious coping at the same time so you can draw on the support of your faith community and that can be good for you. And at the same time, you might believe that the devil is attacking you and that there's demonic influence in your life and this is making you ill. So on the one hand, you're getting the support of the group. You're having comfort from God's um, protection of you and from uh, the power of prayer. But at the same time, you're having this negative influence of, well, Satan is actually uh, making me ill. So there's a, a number of different things all going on and, and the reality of the situation is likely to be more complicated than many research studies to date have been able to address. Um, there's also an issue around um, the stigma associated with mental ill health. So, for example, in some of the studies of psychosis, I'm thinking here of major mental disorders rather than things like anxiety and depression, but at the very time when we know many people with schizophrenia are drawing on positive religious coping and uh, finding support in their faith. Actually, their faith community is withdrawing from them to some extent, is treating them with a degree of suspicion, um, perhaps um, excluding them in some way. Um, you know, you're not well, you can't lead the prayers this week. You know, we, we don't want you to do the reading. It will be too stressful for you, what, whatever it may be. So actually, um, these people are engaging in positive religious coping, but their community is not supporting them. They're not getting the help they need from their faith community. Who will deliver these interventions to young people? So I think it is important not only to acknowledge the differences in the set of beliefs that young people hold as far as religiosity and spirituality is concerned, but also to sensitize the mental health community towards these beliefs and the religious leaders about the mental health needs of young people, especially when uh, they are the de facto providers of mental health in countries like India. That is the first, uh, first destination for young people and the families, if the young people are suffering from, say, depression and anxiety, the first person that comes to their mind is the religious leaders or the person they are following um, in terms of their beliefs. We need to know more about how to integrate better understanding of mental health within faith communities and better understanding of faith within medical communities. And there has been a horrible barrier between the two, which has been really... Um, unhelpful for both sides. So we need to get better at mutual understanding. Maybe, maybe that's not just research, it's more about cross-professional exchanges, um, more interaction between clergy, chaplains and mental health professionals, but we, we certainly need to do something about that. Will interventions work across different countries? The key big things that are missing uh, obviously we talked about a bit earlier about the mechanisms at play and that's probably differential depending on you know what we're talking about in terms of different the different outcomes are we talking about depression or anxiety that that will have differential mechanisms and will have different um will play out differently in different cultural settings and but more importantly is still coming back to this issue around acceptability um, of the intervention, what are the preferred modes of the delivery of the intervention, which for us we found was very different across the two cultural settings in which we discussed, you know, with our youth advisory groups. Um, for example, the Indian youth advisors did not uh, think an, an online intervention would work at all in their setting, but also thinking about, yeah, what is underpinning this intervention in terms of the content because we found sense of purpose was defined quite actually differently in these two groups as well where um, kind of resonating with what Shilpa said Australian young people personal values was the most important thing and for Indian young members the family value was the absolute 100% pinnacle um, had the greatest weight um, you know 
constructs around family honor weren't considered at all in any of the uh, interventions that we reviewed. So again, resonating with what Chris said, like we can't just have a universal intervention model for a lot of these. So we need to be tailoring these at the local level and building it up from that level. And then my final point is just around logistical aspects of these implementation of these interventions. Again, we need to be you know, relying on those local teams. They know best in terms of what's going to work well in their countries, um, you know, and the constraints around, uh, you know, the implementation of, of such interventions. Visit the Wellcome website to find out more about mental health at the Wellcome Trust.